Thank you, everyone, for coming today to the first ACOM. And this is actually a joint seminar with MCUBE. Uh, before we start, I start the introduction of Olivia. I would like to, I have an announcement to make. So uh, Mike Mills has ended up in the committee in ACOM. And now Sasha is going to join me <laughs> to this ACOM seminar committee. So you have any questions or recommendations for speakers, let us know. And now I am really glad to introduce Olivia Clifton. Olivia is an ASP postdoc fellow at ENCA right now. Uh, this past summer, Olivia received her PhD from Columbia University, where she was an NSF grad research fellow and worked with Arlene Fury. At ENCA, Olivia is primarily working in MCUBE with a multi layer canopy LES model to learn more about the processor processes controlling when and where ozone is deposited in the forest canopy. Olivia also plans to work with scientists in ACOM and CGD to translate new understanding gate from this model to large scale atmospheric chemistry modeling. Uh, thanks, Olivia, for coming today. And let's start. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So because this is a joint ACOM and MCUBE seminar. I'm going to give a little introduction to ozone. So in the stratosphere, ozone is good. It protects the Earth from harmful UV radiation. In the troposphere, ozone has multiple roles, and my focus is tropospheric ozone. So in the cold upper troposphere, ozone is a potent greenhouse gas. In the mid to lower troposphere, ozone is the primary source of the hydroxyl radical, or OH, which we call the garbage truck of the atmosphere because it cleanses the atmosphere of reactive greenhouse gases and air pollutants. And in near surface air, is on? It's not on. Okay. Um, and in near surface air, ozone is an air pollutant. It's injurious to both humans and vegetation. So here we're looking at the monitoring sites that are used for US ozone pollution regulation and the and the color of each site shows the level of ozone that was used to assess whether the site was in attainment with the US pollution standard for 2011. And so the red sites are sites that are out of attainment with the 2011 standard, but the red and orange sites are sites that are out of attainment with the current standard. And so we can see that the US ozone pollution problem is spatially widespread. And high ozone events typically occur in densely populated areas and during summer when there are favorable meteorological conditions. The estimated benefits from a one PPB decrease in ground level ozone are $1.4 billion within the United States and 500 to 1,000 avoided premature deaths within North America. Ozone is produced photochemically from both natural and anthropogenic emissions and Ozone production follows nonlinear chemistry. And so reactions between carbon monoxide or non methane volatile organic compounds react with nitrogen oxides to fuel local to regional ozone pollution episodes, whereas reactions between methane and NOx tend to raise hemispheric scale ozone levels. And in regions where there's very high NOx, ozone production can be suppressed. And so ozone is typically controlled for with reductions in regional NOx emissions. I should have mentioned that ozone isn't directly emitted. It's, it's formed through this chemistry. And so the effectiveness of controlling ozone with NOx emission reductions requires considering nonlinear chemistry. The change in ozone in, um, with time at any particular location is a function of transport of ozone into a region, chemical production, transport of ozone out of a region, chemical destruction, and dry deposition. And I represent dry deposition here with a tree because over land, dry deposition primarily occurs to vegetation. But more generally, dry deposition happens when turbulence transports ozone down to the surface, and there's surface-mediated chemistry that destroys ozone. And so the last 30 years of atmospheric chemistry research has really focused on the roles of ambient chemistry and transport, in particular, the role of ozone precursor emissions on trends in variability in tropospheric ozone. But dry deposition is an important and uncertain sink. 
Dry deposition occurs when ozone diffuses into plant stomata and reacts quickly with internal fluids and tissues. And these reactions can be injurious to the plant. So here we're looking at ozone injury on a soybean leaf. And this injury can interrupt local to global carbon and water cycling and influence climate. Ozone is also taken up by non-stomatal pathways. And so one non-stomatal pathway is ozone uptake by leaf cuticular waxes. And we think that this primarily happens when ozone reacts with compounds that are on the leaf wax. And we think that these reactions can be enhanced by surface water films. Ozone is also taken up by the ground. We think that this is primarily ozone reacting with the unsaturated double carbon bonds in soil, and these reactions are blocked by water. And so ozone deposition pathways respond to environmental conditions differently. Most large scale representations of ozone dry deposition are, are pretty crude. And much of the emphasis on ozone dry deposition research has been on stomatal uptake due to the link with plant damage. But ozone dry deposition may be an important control on ozone pollution, including extremes. So here we're looking at a figure from Mayun Lin's 2017 paper. We're looking at interannual variability in ozone concentrations over a regionally representative monitoring site in Pennsylvania. And black are the observations. Purple is the NOAA GFDL chemistry climate model that's been nudged to observe winds. And the red is a sensitivity simulation of the model when where anthropogenic NOx emissions are held constant from year to year. And gray is interannual variability in temperature, which I'll ask you to ignore for now. And so the correlation between the observations and the model for the base case scenario is pretty strong, 0.82. And the correlation reduces to 0.55 when anthropogenic NOx emissions are held constant. And so this suggests that a fair amount of the variability, at least 30%, the, of the interannual variability in ozone concentrations at this site are due to processes other than changing NOx emissions. And in particular, dry deposition velocity is constant from year to year in this model. And Lynn et al. find that reducing ozone dry deposition by 35% during summer 1988, 1988, when there was a really strong drought over the eastern US, increases ozone um, that year and allows the model to capture the really high observed concentrations. And in particular, the decrease in ozone deposition in the model increases ozone on the highest ozone days and gets the model more in line with the observations then. But we have a very limited understanding of daily and interannual variability in ozone dry deposition. And so the main question that I aim to address in my research is how does ground level ozone respond to changing precursor emissions, climate, and ozone dry deposition? More specifically, how does ozone dry deposition vary on different temporal and spatial scales and what controls this variability? How much does neglecting variability in ozone dry deposition matter for projecting ozone pollution accurately? And how do the stomatal versus non-stomatal ozone deposition pathways influence ground level ozone? And so here we're looking at monthly mean ground level ozone concentrations across three, averaged across three regionally representative monitoring sites in the northeastern US. And the solid line is showing the 1991 to 1996 average, and the dashed line is showing the 2004 to 2009 average. And between these two time periods, there were reductions in regional NOx emissions. And so we can see that there are small increases in ozone concentration during the winter and decreases in ozone during the summer. And this is, um, we think, due to nonlinear chemistry. And so in winter, there's a in the first time period, there's a lot of NOx, but there's not a lot of VOCs, and so ozone production is suppressed. And so when we reduce NOx emissions, ozone actually increases. And so this brings up the question of how will ground, the ground level ozone seasonal cycle or monthly mean um, ground level ozone respond to further regional and global precursor emission changes and climate during the 21st century? And so to answer this, we need a general circulation model that has atmospheric chemistry in it. So I use the NOAA GFDL global chemistry climate model. 
And here we're prescribing ozone precursor emissions and a monthly climatology of ozone dry deposition velocities. And this is a global model. Global models are really useful for thinking about ozone pollution because ozone at a given location isn't a simple function of local processes. And so here we're looking at monthly mean ground level ozone or the ozone seasonal cycle from the model averaged across the entire northeastern US domain at the beginning of the 21st century. If we add on um, an, end of the, end, an end of the century ozone seasonal cycle, so in red, this corresponds to RCP 8.5, which is a high warming scenario, we can see that ozone increases a lot during the winter and decreases during the summer. For the end of the century, under RCP 4.5, we also have a wintertime maximum. And so both um, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 have strong reductions in regional NOx emissions, but very different changes in global methane. And I'll remind you that methane is a precursor to ozone. And so this suggests that this reversal of the surface ozone seasonality from a summertime to a wintertime peak is due to the strong projected decreases in NOx emissions, whereas the difference between um, the, the difference in ozone between the scenarios during all months is due to the higher methane in RCP 8.5. And a sensitivity simulation of RCP 8.5 where all where methane concentrations are held at 2005 levels confirms this. And so here again, we're looking at the ground level ozone seasonality at the beginning and end of the 21st century as simulated by the GFDL mo model over the Northeastern US, but we're looking at sensitivity simulations of RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 where all ozone precursor emissions have been fixed at 2005 levels, and only well-mixed greenhouse gases are evolving to 2100 levels. And so this is showing the influence of climate change on ozone seasonality. And so we can see that climate change increases ozone during the high ozone pollution. And this really follows a decade of work suggesting that there's an ozone pollution penalty from climate change. And so these simulations really bring up the question of how does the ground level ozone uh, seasonal cycle change when ozone dry deposition evolves with meteorology and biophysics? And so I'll address this question at the end of the talk, but first um, we need to learn more about ozone deposition. And so I'll go into this question of how does ozone dry deposition vary on different temporal and spatial scales and what controls this variability? Harvard Forest is a temperate deciduous forest in the northeastern US, and it's, um, it has one of the longest ozone eddy covariance flux data sets, or data sets of ozone dry deposition. And there are also measurements of water vapor and carbon dioxide eddy covariance fluxes at Harvard Forest. And so here we're looking at monthly daytime mean ozone deposition velocity at Harvard Forest for all of the years with measurements in colors and the black is showing the multi-year mean. And the ozone deposition velocity is a measure of the efficiency of the removal, removal of ozone by the surface. It's independent of the um, ozone concentration, the ambient ozone concentration. And so we can see that there's a factor of two difference between the highest um, and the lowest year in terms of the deposition velocity for all months of the year, which is really suggesting that there's strong interannual variability. And many years have consistently high average or low deposition velocities during summer, which suggests that there may be seasonal scale environmental controls on the magnitude of the deposition velocity. And this really strong interannual variability is not captured by a state-of-the-art global atmospheric chemistry model. So here we're looking at the GEOS Chem grid box containing Harvard Forest and monthly daytime mean ozone deposition velocities. And GEOS Chem uses the widely used Wesley ozone deposition scheme. Here we're looking at vertical ozone concentration profiles, average uh, so you define the deposition velocity as the ratio of the flux to the mean concentration at what level? Um, at the level of the measurement at Harvard Forest. And what is that? That's 29 meters. 29 meters. How tall are the trees? 24 meters on average. And is this average over day and night? 
Um, this is a daytime average, so 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. is what I do here. Okay, and so this interannual variability is in simulated by GeosChem, which uses the widely used ozone deposition scheme. And here we're looking at vertical um, ozone concentration over the southeastern U.S. for summer 2013 as simulated by the GFDL model. And the black shows the GFDL model, the base case simulation, and the colors show sensitivity simulations where the ozone deposition <coughs> velocity has been perturbed. And this is work done by Colleen Boblitz, who is my peer in the Fiore Atmospheric Chemistry Group at Columbia. And so simulated ozone concentrations are very sensitive to ozone deposition velocity. For a factor of two difference in ozone deposition, deposition velocity, we can see that there's about an 8 ppb difference in ozone concentration at the surface. And the influence of perturbing the ozone deposition velocity um, propagates up into the troposphere. And there have been other studies with similar findings um, for other models that are commonly used for source attribution, including GeosChem. And so my findings that the GeosChem Wesley ozone deposition scheme cannot capture the strong observed interannular variability in ozone deposition velocity at Harvard Forest suggests that using GeosChem or any model um, with a similar deposition scheme to interpret variations in observed ozone concentrations may lead to an over or under emphasis of the role of precursor emissions on ozone. And so now I'd like to get at what's driving the interannual variability in ozone deposition velocity to, at Harvard Forest. And so ozone deposition velocity, which I represent here as VD, is commonly thought of as the inverse of a series of resistances. So RA is the aerodynamic resistance. It's the resistance posed by turbulence. RB is the quasi-laminar resistance. It's the resistance posed by molecular diffusion in the small boundary layer between the atmosphere and the canopy. And RC is the canopy resistance. It's the resistance posed by the non-stomatal and stomatal components of the canopy. And so I can estimate RA and RB using classic equations and infer RC the canopy resistance by inverting the deposition velocity from the ozone eddy covariance observations and subtracting the estimates of RA and RB. And I want to do this because I'm going to focus um, for the next couple slides on the summertime daytime when ozone deposition velocity and ozone concentrations are really high. Um, and RA and RB are often very low during the summer daytime. And so RC, the canopy resistance, is really controlling variations in the deposition velocity. And so if we assume that RC controls the interannual variations in the ozone deposition velocity, then the question becomes um, which stomatal and non-stomatal processes are driving the interannual variation. And so the inverse of a resistance is a conductance. And so GC is our canopy conductance. It's the inverse of the canopy resistance. And um, we think of GC as the sum of the non-stomatal conductance and the stomatal conductance. So the stomatal conductance is GS, GS and the non-stomatal conductance is GNS. And so I estimate stomatal conductance at Harvard Forest um, in two independent ways that are driven by Harvard Forest observations. And so the first model is based on carbon dioxide fluxes, and it's an optimal photosynthesis, minimal transpiration model. And the second method is a water vapor flux-based estimate. It's an inversion of penman monteith and so here I'm showing the summertime daytime averages for the carbon flux-based and water flux-based estimates. The different years are shown in colors, and the black is the multi-year mean. And so we can see that there's a factor of two to three difference in magnitude between these estimates. But if I normalize each yearly estimate by the respective multi-year mean for the model, we can see that there's fairly similar interannual variability um, between these two estimates. Going back to looking at the absolute magnitude of stomatal conductance as suggested by the carbon flux and water flux based methods and comparing that magnitude with the magnitude of the canopy conductance or GC, we can see that only the water flux based stomatal conductance estimate is lower in magnitude than the canopy conductance. And because we want to um, 
or I want to infer the non-stomatal conductance, the GNS, from or by subtracting the stomatal conductance, GS, from the canopy conductance, GC, the carbon flux based stomatal conductance estimate would give an unphysically negative non stomatal conductance. And so I just use the water flux based estimate um, because they have similar interannual variability. And so here we're looking at um, the summer daytime averages for the ozone deposition velocity, the non stomatal conductance, and the relative non stomatal fraction of the total deposition. And so because um, these three quantities have very similar interannual um, variability or the year-to-year -year ranking, year, have very similar year-to-year -year rankings, this suggests that the non, that non-stomatal processes are really driving the interannual variability in ozone deposition velocity at Harvard Forest, bringing up the question of which non-stomatal processes drive the variability. And so here we're looking at summertime average diurnal courses of ozone deposition velocity estimated by two models. And so for both of these models, I'm using the water flux based stomatal conductance estimate, but two different models for non stomatal conductance. And so these models differ in their cuticular and ground based deposition estimates. And so the model on the left is the Zhang et al. To, um, 2002 model, and the model on the right is the Massman 2004 model. And if we compare um, the estimated ozone deposition velocities to the observed ozone deposition velocities, we can see that these models largely bound the, the multi-year mean observed ozone deposition velocity. And in both the observed and estimated ozone deposition velocity composites here, I've excluded rainy days in order to avoid changes in ozone deposition with wetness. But, um, but I hypothesize that um, changes in soil moisture and the influence on ground deposition need to be more explicitly accounted for in these models. And so here we're looking at this, the estimated stomatal contribution and the observed ozone deposition velocity for all of the years at Harvard Forest that have both um, ozone eddy covariance measurements and complementary micrometeorological measurements. And so again, we can see that stomatal deposition is an important fraction of the total, but doesn't control the interannual variability in ozone deposition velocity. And adding on the Massman et al. 2004 estimate of cuticular deposition, we can see that the magnitude of the observed ozone deposition velocity is explained well for a couple of years, but it's not fully explained for many years. And the Zhang et al. non stomatal model gives a similar result. And so then the question becomes, how do I estimate changes in ground deposition with soil moisture when there are not soil moisture measurements for all of the years at Harvard Forest? And so I use a cumulative, um, an indicator of um, soil wetness that's based on cumulative rain over the summer and how the observed cumulative rain compares to kind of an arbitrary threshold. And so, for example, if cumulative, if the observed cumulative rain is above this threshold, then I say that ozone deposition to the ground is suppressed. And if cumulative, the cumulative rain is below this threshold, and then I say ozone, depo ozone deposition to the ground occurs. And for the five years that we do have soil moisture measurements, this indicator agrees reasonably well with the magnitude and the seasonality of, of soil moisture at 10 centimeters depth. And so if I add on um, this new estimate of ground deposition, we can see that the magnitude of the o observed ozone deposition velocity is fairly well explained um, for all years, suggesting that ozone deposition to the ground and changes with soil moisture may control the ranking of years in terms of the interannual variability in ozone deposition velocity. But there are some underestimates, particularly in the morning during several years. And I'll come back to this in a bit. This model also explains observed ozone deposition velocity at the two other northeastern US forests with short-term measurements. So here we're looking um, on, 
at Cane Forest on the left and Sands Flats on the right. So Cane Forest is a is a deciduous forest in northwestern Pennsylvania, and Sands Flats is a mixed forest in upstate New York. And we can see that for um, at least after around 10 a.m., the, the magnitude of the ozone deposition velocity is explained well at these two sites, but there is this morning underestimate, which has been previously attributed to um, high morning ozone deposition to dew-covered leaves, which I don't account for in this model. And so if we move from thinking about interannual variability in ozone deposition to thinking about daily variability in deposition, I find that stomatal conductance is, um, is an important predictor of ozone deposition. So on the y-axis, I'm showing ozone deposition velocity. And on the x-axis, I'm showing stomatal conductance. And we're looking at anomalies here. I've removed yearly and monthly variations. And that stomatal conductance conductance is an important predictor of daily variations in ozone deposition velocity is consistent across three stomatal conductance models at Harvard Forest. So the water vapor flux-based estimate, the carbon flux-based estimate, but also an empirical model um, that was built for Harvard Forest by Rick Weir and Scott Skaleska. I also find using multiple linear regression analysis that humidity is an important predictor of ozone deposition velocity. And this may represent cuticular uptake, which is consistent with field and laboratory studies. And so the idea here is that under high relative humidity, there are thin water films that form on the leaf cuticles that can speed up the um, surface chemistry that destroys ozone. And so an important question is, is the strong interannual variability in ozone deposition velocity at Harvard Forest observed at the regional scale? And so I don't really have the observations um, that are needed to address this question fully. But here I'm comparing um, the observations at Harvard Forest and Cane Forest during 97 and Harvard Forest and Sands Flats during 98. And the top panels are showing morning ozone deposition velocities, and the bottom panels are showing afternoon ozone deposition velocities. And so we can see that morning ozone deposition velocity is fairly consistently higher at Harvard Forest, um, but we don't see this difference during the afternoon. And stomatal conductance doesn't explain these differences. And so because LAI or leaf area index is higher at Harvard Forest um, as compared to both of the other sites, both of the short-term sites. I hypothesize that ozone deposition to dew-covered leaves may explain the higher morning uptake at Harvard Forest. And so if you recall that there were, there were several years with um, underestimated ozone deposition velocities at Harvard Forest. This suggests that there may be interannual and interforest differences in ozone deposition to dew covered leaves. And so the takeaways from my work on ozone deposition velocities at observational monitoring sites suggest that there's strong interannual variability and that it may be due to changes in ground deposition with soil moisture. And that stomatal deposition contributes to daily variability in ozone deposition velocity, and there's likely some influence from cuticular deposition. I also see unexplained strong morning interforest and interannual variations in ozone deposition velocity, and they may be due to variations in ozone deposition to do. And so next, I'll address these last two questions. How much does neglecting variability in ozone dry deposition matter for projecting ozone pollution accurately? And how do the stomatal and non-stomatal ozone deposition pathways influence ground level ozone? And so here I come back to using the NOAA GFDL chemistry climate model. And so now, instead of having ozone, uh, a monthly climatology of ozone deposition velocities prescribed, ozone deposition is a part of, um, of the land component of the model. And I contributed to the development of this, but Fabian Pillow at GFDL really deserves the credit for developing this scheme. And so in this new dynamic ozone dry deposition parameterization, we use stomatal conductance 
And for the non-stomatal deposition pathways, we use canopy and soil cycling of water and snow and stem and leaf area index that have been simulated by the land component of the GFDL model. And while previous work has tied ozone deposition to stomatal conductance in land models, um, previous work has largely overlooked the role of dynamic non-stomatal deposition processes. And so I'm going to benchmark the simulation of ozone with this new dynamic ozone deposition scheme against a simulation with the monthly climatology of ozone deposition velocities. And this monthly climatology has been calculated offline um, in GeosChem using this widely used Wesley scheme. And in particular, we're going to look at 20 um, time slice simulations for the 2010s and 2090s. Um, that are simulations of RCP 8.5. And each time slice has 10 years, and anthropogenic ozone precursor emissions and well-mixed greenhouse gases are fixed at either 2000 or 2090 levels. And so here we're looking at monthly mean observed and simulated ozone deposition velocities. And so the black is the multi-year mean, and the gray is the single year of the observations if, that, um, if there's multiple years. And the blue is the GFDL model. And here we've archived the ozone deposition velocity for the grid point closest to the observational monitoring site um, for the respective land use type that um, best characterizes the observational site. And so we can see that ozone deposition velocity is captured well at most of these sites for, for all months of the year. And so ground level ozone concentrations are too high in most atmospheric chemistry models. And here we're looking at the change in the winter model ozone bias. And so blue represents model improvement and a red represents a model worsening. And so we're looking at the change in the ozone bias with um, the new ozone deposition scheme. And so most previous work has focused on ozone deposition during the summer, including my own. But we can see that changes in wintertime ozone deposition lead to wide, widespread reductions in ozone concentrations. And this improvement is largely due to the influence of a more process-oriented representation of snow cover um, on ozone deposition. And I also find that winter lower to mid tropospheric ozone improves against remote ozone song measurements, which suggests that both local and remote sinks are important for, for, a region's given, um, for given regions wintertime ozone pollution. And this is the same plot, but for summertime ozone. So we're looking at um, the model improvement in blue or model worsening with this new dynamic ozone deposition scheme. So we can see that over many regions there's an improvement, but over some regions the model is worse at, at capturing the observed ozone concentrations. And in particular, there's no improvement where the satellite leaf area index, or LAI, that's used to drive the offline monthly climatology is higher than the model LAI that's used in the new ozone deposition scheme. And so obviously, accurate simulation of ozone dry deposition really hinges on capturing the location and amount of vegetation accurately. And so here we're looking at present day summer daily ozone probability distributions um, for the new dynamic ozone deposition scheme in black. And the green um, is showing the the ozone simulation where the monthly climatology of ozone deposition velocities is used. And so we can see that um, there are fewer high ozone days over the northeastern US and eastern Asia, but there are more high and more low ozone days over central Europe with this new ozone deposition scheme. But I find that um, in this model, both stomatal and non-stomatal ozone deposition pathways are really important for daily variability in ozone deposition. Um, and this is in contrast with recent work, which has really suggested that stomatal variations in stomatal ozone deposition are important for, for governing daily variations in deposition velocity and thus ozone pollution.
So if you recall, um, at the beginning of the talk, I showed that there was a reversal of the ground level ozone seasonality under RCP 8.5 during the 21st century. And so here we're looking at the change in the ozone seasonality um, under RCP 8.5 over the northeastern US, East Asia, and Central Europe. And the red, the red simulation is the new dynamic ozone dry deposition simulation, and the gray simulation is the simulation with the monthly climatology of ozone deposition velocities. And so we can see um, that the wintertime increases in ozone pollution under RCP 8.5 are tempered, and that's because there are increases in ozone dry deposition due to less snow cover by the end of the 21st century. During summer, there's um, not many changes in there are not changes in the change in ozone concentrations with dynamic ozone dry deposition, and that's because there are offsetting future changes in summer deposition pathways. And so over the northeastern US, we have increases in cuticular deposition, de decreases in stomatal deposition, and spatial heterogeneity in the change in ground uptake. Over Central Europe, we have increases in cuticular deposition and spatial heterogeneity in the change, in the sign of the change for the stomatal and ground uptake pathways. And then for East Asia, we also have increases in leaf cuticular deposition, but decreases in stomatal deposition and no change in, in ground deposition. And so um, on the left, we can see that there's a lot of variability in the change in cuticular deposition, and this really reflects um, increases in leaf area index with carbon dioxide fertilization, um, and um, the change in the distribution of coniferous versus deciduous forests. And then the change in stomatal uptake um, in the second panel really re also reflects um, stomatal closure under higher CO2, so another effect of CO2 fertilization, but also the expansion of plants into new regions or more growth of plants in regions where they couldn't really grow before. And the change in ground uptake reflects changes in um, forest height and forest structure as well as soil moisture. And so the takeaways from my large-scale modeling work are that there's a shift in the high ozone pollution season over polluted regions under strong NOx emission reductions. Wintertime ozone is sensitive to ozone dry deposition and increases in ozone dry deposition may temper projected ozone increases. There are daily variations in summertime ozone deposition, including from non-stomatal deposition processes, and these are important for ozone pollution. And future changes in summer ozone deposition are a fine balance between changes in individual pathways. And this really motivates more better mechanistic understanding of these non-stomatal deposition pathways. And so the broader implications of this work are that there are unexpected variations in observed ozone, observed non-stomatal ozone dry deposition. And these variations really reinforce the need for long-term measurements and motivate field campaigns that target ind um, individual processes and constraints on spatial coherency. And I also suggest that multiple constraints and or process level models should be used to characterize observed variations in ozone deposition velocity accurately. I also find that ozone dry deposition influence, influences ozone pollution, both at the hemispheric scale and for extremes. And this suggests that efforts to improve understanding of summer non-stomatal deposition pathways should proceed along the same alongside the same efforts for stomatal deposition. And I find a sensitivity of winter time ozone to deposition really emphasizes a need for better understanding of ozone deposition to to cold surfaces. And so um, for much of this work, I've had to make a lot of assumptions about above and in canopy turbulence. And for my ASP fellowship, I'd like to use the um, multi-layer canopy LES or large eddy simulation model to constrain where ozone is deposited in the forest canopy. And I'd like to include a simple chemical mechanism in this model to see how this changes with ambient chemical sinks of ozone. 
and quantify, I'd like to quantify the dependence on canopy structure, atmospheric stability, and the type of biogenic emissions that are dominating an ecosystem. And so um, I'd like to acknowledge um, my collaborators at Columbia and NOAA GFGL, as well as everyone who has made these ozone deposition measurements that I've made, or that I've used. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Olivia. Are there any questions? Um, thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, I have a few quick questions. Uh, first one is, uh, in your dynamic ozone deposition model, have you considered the dynamic vegetation uh, evolution? For example, this may be important when you project the uh, climate effects into uh, the end of the century. Because uh, uh, you mentioned uh, it may mainly it is mainly due to the snow cover change, uh, which may expose uh, uh, too much uh, canopy, uh, which further uh, increases the dry deposition. Uh, if you use the dynamic uh, vegetation model, uh, would you uh, consider the uh, like different canopy uh, cover fraction in the future? Uh, so it is a dynamic vegetation model. The ozone deposition scheme is in this dynamic vegetation model. So it's using all these changes in vegetation from present to future. Okay. Um, the second question is that um, so in your uh, morning uh, underestimate for the model as, uh, calculations uh, you presented in your first part. Um, so it's very interesting that um, it's probably due to the uh, deposition accelerated by the dew uh, on the leaves. Um, so have you also considered the damage caused by ozone to the leaves, uh, which is like two-way interactions between ozone and the leaves, uh, which may also do some role? Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't considered here the feedback um, that stomatal uptake of ozone may have on stomatal uptake, or how if there's higher ozone uptake by dew cover leaves, how that might protect the plant from from stomatal uptake of ozone. But that's um, research I, I hope to pursue here. Okay. Um, so one last question is that, um, so is there any lab measurements or experiments to show the uh, chemistry accelerated by the dew on the leaves? Uh, if yes, then uh, would you like consider uh, incorporating that into your model to do a sensitivity test to see if you can capture the morning uh, peak of the uh, observation? Yeah, so um, laboratory studies have suggested that um, it really matters which compounds are on the leaf for the chemistry to be sped up. And so to incorporate that in a large scale model, you would have to track what has been previously deposited to the leaf. So I think that would be very interesting, but I don't have current plans to do that. Are there more questions? So when you talk about uh, ground level ozone, what level is the ground level? I think in the model, it's, it's a bit higher than, than the observations. Um, so the lowest level of the model, depending on the model, could be 50 meters, but the observations are much, much below that. Thanks, Olivia. So I have a question about your morning underestimates. And have you considered the influence of morning boundary layer growth and the rapid entrainment of free tropospheric species into the system? And how yeah, so influences? I wanted to talk to you about that, actually. But I have considered that. But they're not morning underestimates. They're differences between the sites. And so if the boundary layer growth was different at Harvard versus Kane, and Harvard versus Sands Flat, then that could be definitely influencing this. Do you have to allow for differences between deciduous and non-deciduous vegetation? In terms of what? <clears throat> In terms of, uh, say, stomatal or non-stomatal. So, yeah, I mean, most stomatal conductance models um, 
in large in large scale models have different one tuning parameters for different um, land use or land cover types, and then photosynthesis could be a little different. The photosynthesis is is going into the stomatal conductance calculation, and most of the non stomatal parameterizations that have been developed are based on um, are empirical. They're they're based on observations at say one mixed forest or one deciduous forest. And so the um, different non stomatal parameterizations are different for these different land use or land cover types, but we don't really understand why. Um, are there more questions? Um, being a total novice with the topic, <laughs> Uh, how does the model actually compute that quantity you have on the vertical axis? Um, from the gradient of the flux. So it uses a boundary layer parameterization of the flux? Ah. Does that number vary if you would happen to vary the boundary layer parameterization? It should vary. It should vary, but it doesn't. The diffusivity is what you're talking about? OK, so you run a large scale model. It's got some parameterization of the boundary layer. There's many, many, many of those. Uh, and so I'm just curious if you repeated that, those runs with a different boundary layer model, how different is that quantity on the vertical axis? I would expect that it would be different by 10%. It could be different by 10 to 20 percent, depending on the time of day. Most of most of the deposition velocity, most of the variations in the deposition velocity are from this, are from variations in the stomatal and the non-stomatal deposition. But the boundary layer parameterization definitely matters. Um, then uh, I'm curious, uh, how heterogeneous are your sites where these things are modeled? Uh, if it's, let's say it's relatively smooth, jumps up, service gets really rough, then goes to something else, uh, does it vary a little, a lot, over varying terrain like that? Um, most of the ozone eddy covariance flux data sets have been at sites with pretty homogeneous um, canopy tops. Are there any more questions? No? If no? So what is the influence of carbon dioxide on this ground level also? I didn't hear you. Influence of carbon dioxide. I can't hear you. What is the influence of carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide. Oh, um, so the influence of carbon dioxide through carbon dioxide fertilization. Um, the way that it's parameterized in the GFDL model is that um, there are kind of two effects. And I was alluding to this at the um, end of the talk. So the long-term effect is that there's just more biomass. The plant accumulates more biomass over, um, over the 21st century. And that's leading to much higher LAI, which is increasing the cuticular uptake. Um, and because LAI really strongly drives the cuticular uptake. But the other effect of um, carbon dioxide fertilization is kind of more of a short-term effect, and it leads to stomatal closure. And so that's why, even though we have much higher biomass, we're actually not getting much change um, in stomatal conductance, because we have more biomass, but we have stomata opening less. And so there's a lot of uncertainties with the, in terms of the effect of carbon dioxide on biomass accumulation and stomatal conductance and photosynthesis, but um, this is what's going on in the GFTL model. Any more questions? I like that. Yeah, I just wondered, what are some of the, what are the, uh, uh, key chemical compounds on the leaf in a dew situation or a thin film 
that really accelerate the uh, ozone deposition? Um, mostly, I think we think that organic compounds mm -hmm. drive much higher ozone deposition. But there's also been laboratory studies that suggest that if there are um, chlorine or bromine ions in the water film, then they can really accelerate the chemistry. Um, so I think the question is where are these compounds coming from? Are they deposited or are they exuded from the leaf itself based on due to some stress? Um, or are they a part of the leaf wax? And well, I, the thing that I wondered about is how close are these sites to uh, urban areas, big urban areas, or uh, even maybe there's some local agricultural practices that would generate some of this stuff. Right. Yeah, and I think that could be contributing to the interannual or inter interforest differences, but it's really hard to constrain. Um, and. So, so I think taking into account local sources, but also, um, you know, what might that particular uh, forest tree be doing that a forest tree at Harvard wouldn't necessarily be doing? Are there any more questions? No, that was great. No, let's thank Olivia.